Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for bearing with us through some uh, early Friday afternoon uh, technical difficulties here. Again, my name is uh, Nate Weisenberg. I'm a the senior program associate with the AAAS Center for Scientific Responsibility and Justice, which serves as the secretariat for the Science and Human Rights Coalition, uh, which is this week and early next week are uh, the annual meeting of, of this coalition. Of, uh, science and, uh, of science and engineering membership organizations that recognize a role for scientists and engineers in human rights. Uh, we're really excited about today's session, which is highlighting the SciTech and Human Rights Future Gen Scholars. And we are uh, very pleased to be joined uh, by scholars from all three years of the program's existence so far, uh, 21, 2021 to 2022. 2022 to 2023 and 2023 to 2024. In just a moment, I'll be mentioning their names and I'll be turning it over to them uh, for their presentations. But just a quick word about what the program is. So each year, uh, students can present uh, an idea for a project uh, that combines science and human rights and involves work on their campus or in their community. Um, and these projects can come from a wide variety of disciplines, which I think you'll see reflected in the presentation today. And if they go through a sort of application process, uh, they're reviewed by the Coalition Steering Committee, and each year we have two to three projects that we uh, recognize as SciTech and Human Rights Future Gen Scholars. Uh, the project receives $5,000 to support the work the students carry out, um, and we uh, have also been providing students with uh, mentoring opportunities with co coalition members and, and other uh, ideas for professional development to help strengthen their future growth and, and work uh, as, as um, science and human rights uh, I feel like I keep saying scholars again, but science and human rights scholars, people who are um, really doing great and, and, and I think important work um, in showing the connections between science and human rights and really demonstrating the passion and commitment um, that students bring to these important issues. So without any uh, further ado, I'll introduce our speakers and then I will turn it over to our first speaker for their presentation. Um, we're joined today um, by uh, first by Margaret um, Meg Sanders um, and Hamza Woodson, who are to the 2021 2022 scholars. Um, following their presentations, we'll hear from Julia Bauer and Hannah Kamran, who are 2022 2023 scholars, and they worked on a joint project together. And then, last but certainly not least, we'll hear from Sierra Laveroni, one of the 20 through 24 Future Gen scholars. Not all scholars were able to attend today, but we hope you enjoy hearing from these presentations and from these from these students and, and their and their presentations. And we'll have some time at the end for questions and answers and discussion. Thank you so much, everyone. And Meg, I'm going to turn it over to you for your presentation. All right. Thank you so much, Nathaniel. I'm sharing my screen right now. And all right, so starting it off at this year's conference, once again, my name is Margaret Sanders. You can also call me Meg. Um, and I was a member of the inaugural um, year of the SciTech and Human Rights Future Gen Scholars Program. So just first and foremost, a little bit about me. Um, while I was doing the program with AAAS, I was finishing up my senior year at the University of Connecticut, studying natural resources and the environment. Um, once I finished, um, I proceeded to get my master's in sustainable engineering and environmental management at Georgia Tech. Um, and now I'm in Austin, Texas, I'm doing software engineering for a sustainability um, tech company. And overall, my interest, and as you can kind of see throughout the trajectory of the past couple of years for me, my interests and passions really lie within the environmental justice movement and finding the intersections between sustainability and technology. Um, so the title of my Future Gen Scholars project was Recalling the Past to Shape the Future. And this project was a community-based oral history project that collected the lived experiences of diverse environmental advocates and activists within Connecticut, which is my home state and what I considered or what I considered to be my community at the time. Um, so as you can see on the right here, here are some faces of my wonderful respondents. Um, so really throughout this process, I, I used snowball sampling, meaning I started with a couple of people who were from diverse communities, meaning that may be um, in terms of you know, racial diversity, gender, sexual orientation, sexuality, um, differently abled folks. So really just tried to find a diverse range of folks um, and interview, sat them down and interviewed them to highlight and learn how their work, their perspectives and their identities made a difference in their communities and the world with regard to environmentalism. So really I tried to find and drive down like how and why their identities 
drove their work and how their identities, um, you know, made them want to be environmentalists um, and how it contributed to that. So my goal with this was to ensure that future change makers found inspiration from these stories of the respondents and see environmental advocates and activists who identified like them or who had similar life experiences as their own to encourage their own journeys. The project deliverables ended up being a podcast on Spotify with episodes for each respondent. I also created a website that hosts bios for each respondent, kind of explaining their background a little bit more into their identities, hosted the interviews as well, so you can access the interviews from the website. And um, for all intents and purposes, I provided transcripts of each interview as well, just in case folks um, you know, who are hard of hearing or who prefer to read could still access the information and the wonderful stories shared by each respondent. I was also able, thanks to the grant funding, to redistribute much, much of that funding back to the community members. So I would compensate them you know, for working with me and interviewing for me and meeting with me multiple times for their time, their expertise, and also their willingness to share their experiences um, and you know oftentimes we would get into very you know personal stories that affected their lives and their journey so I made sure to compensate them you know equitably for how much they contributed to this project. My key takeaways that I learned from this project and hope to share with the others around me were first and foremost that community matters. Um, so whether built on joy or resilience, respondent stories demonstrated how no community must be left behind, especially when advocating for our environment. Um, you'll see the quote below, which actually came directly from an interview. Um, this one was from uh, a law student named Liz Jacobs, and she states that in community together, we must imagine, dream, and build transformative new systems that are grounded in mutual aid, justice, and restoration that allow people on the planet to thrive. So this was just a small tidbit of, you know, the gold nuggets that these respondents, um, you know, shared with me and their thoughts and insights into environmentalism and how we should approach it. Um, you know, so in that, I also learned that decolonizing the environmental movement is essential for social, racial, and environmental justice. And most importantly, everyone's role in the environmental movement matters, but especially the historical contributions made by Black, Indigenous, and individuals of color. So now I want to talk a little bit about what I'm up to now and how that relates um, back to this project and how this project, um, you know, kind of shaped me and drove me to end up in this path. So right now I work for a Nordic based uh, sustainability tech company called Position Green. Um, this company is a full service provider, um, meaning that we provide consulting services, software services, um, and academy, like we um, provide classes on things like, um, you know, things necessary for their environment, meaning like um, GHG emissions, um, you know, energy. Basically, we help companies um, kind of gather their data, collect and analyze. Um, and through this, and especially through, you know, the work that I did in the Future Gen Scholars Project, I learned the importance of um, I learned the importance of how, you know, when we're thinking about the environment, we need to think about it in a really holistic way, meaning how our communities, different communities impacted, um, and also thinking about how sustainability can be driven through technology. Um, so another huge thing about human, or excuse me, Position Green um, are their human rights work. So as you can see here, here are some areas of expertise that uh, Position Green is involved in. We do strategy and communication, climate and environment, sustainable finance, and lastly, and probably most importantly, human rights. Um, I actually just created a software for them on a human rights um, regulation that just came out in another country. And it's really, it's been extremely rewarding for me to kind of see this journey and this passion of mine for environmental justice and the intersections between human rights and environmentalism come to fruition through this work and, you know, through this whole process. Um, so I'm, I'm just so thankful for, you know, everything I learned and everything my community gave back to me through this process. Um, so more specifically, connecting, you know, technology and human rights with the work that I'm currently doing. Um, these are some examples of core human rights due diligence services that um, Position Green offers. So we do human rights due diligence gap analysis. We do human rights saliency assessments, um, and we do anchoring of human rights. So we really help companies understand, especially within their supply chains, like where are the human rights impacts, where are the human rights risks, um, and how can we make sure that their operations are in alignment and are compliant with human rights regulations. For example, um, the Canadian Modern Slavery Act that was just released that targets um, forced and child excuse me forced and child labor within supply chains. 
Um, so really just seeing like on a global scale, you know, the intersections between technology, sustainability, human rights, it's been, it's been really interesting and really informative. Um, and I'm, I'm loving, you know, the learning that is still going on. Um, yeah, so that's the end of my, um, my journey for now. Um, but if you have any questions and or inquiries about either the work I'm currently doing or my project, um, or if you are, you know, are seeking any mentorship within the sustainability or tech field, please feel free to um, reach out to me. I also want to just quickly share the website that I made. Um, this was one of the deliverables I mentioned. So this is a list of all the questions that I asked each respondent during the interviews. I will preface that not interview, not every interview was like a cookie cutter, you know, went the same way. It more turned into a conversation, um, you know, with each one. So these questions and the order of them varied a little bit depending on, um, you know, folks answers, but here are the respondent bios as well as their transcript and interview, or excuse me, the link to the Spotify interviews and transcripts for each respondent. Um, but yeah, that's all I'd like to share at this time. Thank you so much. Um, and I hope that um, folks get some type of inspiration from that type of work. So thank you all so much for watching. Thanks very much, Meg. Uh, Hamza, over to you. Hello, hello. Uh, let me just start sharing my screen now. Um, sorry, give me one second. Share. A little all over the place. Um, okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Hamza Woodson. I'm not sure if my um, not sure. I'm not sure if my actual like face is being shown right now because I'm using two devices, but. Uh, I was part of the inaugural cohort uh, for the SciTech and FutureGen Scholars cohort. Um, I'm currently a junior, uh, junior college student uh, doing a joint degree program between Williams College and the University of Oxford, um, studying anthropology, archaeology, and I'm also concentrating in geography. Uh, so within geography, I'm also looking at a lot of like cultural heritage, which uh, which I'll talk about in relevance to like what the project is, what, what my project, what my AAAS project was about. And I'll also talk about how cultural heritage as a whole, and specifically my research interests have developed like uh, throughout the course of this project and after. Uh, so just to step right in, my project was called Human Rights and Cultural Heritage Man and Cultural Heritage in Ethiopia. Um, and then just to give a little bit of an overview of the presentation. So uh, I'm going to talk about like the background of the conflict. So what, what the conflict uh, was entailing in terms of like uh, the people who are fighting, the guerrilla groups who are fighting, and also just like the wider, wider political factions that were ensuing. Um, and then two, I'm going to give like a brief rundown of cultural heritage and human rights uh, within within Ethiopia and then just like bro more broader like UN definitions and stuff like that. Um, uh, the And then the middle part of the presentation, I'll give an overview of the project itself uh, and I'll give a relevant case study as to better explain how I came to this like methodology that I ensued, that I pursued uh, throughout the project. And then um, I'm gonna talk about the research methods and goals. And then I'm also gonna talk about the results that that came about from the project and then also what I'm developing based on the results that I got from this uh, that I'm like currently pursuing now. So I'll talk about that later on. Um, so just to give a little bit of a background. So um, on November 4th, 2020, uh, armed conflict broke out between the Ethiopian National Defense Force, which is the ENDF and the ED and, and between the EDF. Um, and then also between the uh, Tigray Defense Force, which is known as the TDF, which was the um, the core, like what, what they call it, the rebel defense group that was living in Tigray and that was fighting against the, the wider national government. Um, and then as of present day, the conflict has like extremely like, exponentially worsened and the human and, and the humanitarian impact on ethnic Tigrayan peoples has been catastrophic. Um, it's now above the, the these numbers are outdated by a little bit. It's now above uh, uh, one million in terms of like in terms of casualties and also displaced people. So a lot, majority of these like displaced peoples have moved into Uganda, um, just southern Ethiopia, 
uh, wide, wider parts of Sudan, of the Sudan, uh, places like that. Uh, and then also in addition to attacks on civilians and extrajudicial ki killings, this project specifically focused on how cultural heritage um, uh, was was being managed and how, or, or mismanaged for that matter, and how uh, processes of ethnic cleansing uh, impacts impacts the ways in which cultural heritage is um, is damaged or uh, is destroyed for that matter. Um, so, just to go into what what the project actually defines as cultural heritage. So, according to the United Nations Educational and Scientific uh, a cultural organization, UNESCO, um, cultural heritage is an integral component of human rights uh, in every individual and community, regardless of their political affiliation, race, sex, gender, they all have a right to understand and have access to visit and maintain connection to uh, cultural heritage sites and cultural expressions and expressions of their own culture. Um, and sort of what the project's focus the project's focus was based off of this definition. So we looked at sites uh, that were specifically on the physical aspect of culture or more or less the um, the, the, the actual ruins or the actual like physical sites that we could go and monitor and uh, use like scientific evidence to better support claims about ethnic cleansing and cultural heritage uh, uh, um, destruction, sorry. Um, and then also because of due to the ongoing conflict in the Tigray region, uh, the 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 understanding of physical integrity not only impacts our understanding of cultural heritage management, but also just like the extent to which um, sort of the extent to which that uh, like other buildings are being damaged as well, so like city centers and things of that nature, um, and also like villages and towns and, and roads and other infrastructure. Um, and then sort of looking at the the project itself. So the project was sort of a twofold project. So it was conducted as a joint curriculum development project. And it was also uh, a good, a good, another good chunk of it was an active research program. So what I talked to you about before was the active research program that was focused on recording and tracking the, the destruction of cultural heritage sites throughout the region. And then another, uh, side of the project was talking about the the curriculum development so we so we developed the curriculum for for east african history and, uh, and archaeology uh for baltimore city schools so we implemented that in like a, a bunch of middle schools throughout throughout baltimore uh, throughout baltimore inner cities and we talked to principals and uh as of now like we've every year we've been going to um at least I've been going to uh, a bunch of different like middle schools and high schools to give like presentations and talks on like what what exactly is East African heritage and why we should talk about East Africa as like a wider global region. Um, and then that so that's been in, so that's still ongoing. And and so but the actual like research aspect. So a lot of it was done through the use of GIS. So geospatial information systems. So what we did was we quantifiably measured and assessed the damage of protect, protected archaeological sites through so like aerial mapping, uh, thermal detection, remote sensing. We did a lot of like computational work in terms of like how the changes in landscapes differed from year to year or like even month to month using using satellite images. And then we would like apply an algorithm to see like what's the difference between these images. And then we can also like use just like naked eye and seeing those differences as well. Um, and through that, we were able to detect like wide spans of of destruction happening in certain regions. Uh, and then just a little bit about the case study here. Uh, so AAAS, so a, a lot of the inspiration for how we pursued this project was from a previous case study that uh, AAAS pursued uh, through the through Azerbaijan, and this was done through high resolution satellite imagery. So this was largely through remote sensing and like. It's like a naked eye identification of like burial burial mounds, um, and showing like how like these distinct patterns of like shadows, uh, and sort of like you can you can see that there's structures seeing like you can see how there's shadows, showing like the, both the height and the actual significance of the size, of some of these of some of these like um, 
grave sites are. Uh, and the difference between like earlier, the difference between like earlier images of these sites versus now where you do see a clear destruction of some of the grave sites uh, that was that allowed for AAAS to then say, oh, we just discovered that there has been destruction of of grave sites throughout this area. We can mark this out and we can disseminate this out to uh, cultural heritage nonprofits who can better disseminate this out to like things like CNN and like news networks and uh, people who work with uh, heritage at risk uh, for that matter. So uh, all that all that is to say this all followed in, we, we, we basically just followed in the footsteps of what was already pre being previously done through remote sensing largely. Um, and then Finally, just to talk about like the research processes, I already talked a little bit about it, but uh, we use like ArcGIS and Envi and remote sensing technologies and like automated change. So like all that goes to show for like algorithms that allowed us to like detect changes between satellite images to see like how, what was it, one, the extent of destruction, but also to where was it happening? Um, and then overall, the result of the project provided accurate analysis and data that we then disseminated to groups such as ICOMOS, which is uh, which is like the UN branch of um, U UNESCO branch that looks at like cultural heritage, uh, but it specifically works in like the DC and Baltimore area. And then we also uh, worked with uh, some other groups that were like Baltimore focused, uh, which also was very relevant to helping us bridge the connection between like laymen, laymen educational workers and also like people who are working in the field on like cultural heritage at risk. So a lot of this was talking about uh, just like how do we bridge it all into one active project essentially, the cultural, the curriculum project and also the active research program. Um, and then this was, uh, let me see if I can, Go to my, sorry, give me one second. <laughs> uh, and then just to give a little bit of an overview of what I'm currently working on. So I have been a while at Oxford. I've been working with this lab called the Oxford Resilient uh, Buildings and Landscapes Lab. So Ox, which is uh, known like as through an acronym called Ox Rubble, uh, which provides uh, a uh, research focus at the intersection of like geomorphology and cultural heritage conservation uh, is found at oxrubble.com if you want more information about what we do. Um, and currently I'm pursuing like more, more, more in tune with what we've been doing previously, but I'm actually looking at structural in integrity and like structural modeling of these sites rather than just doing uh, remote sensing or like the um, GIS work. So I'm actually working on like the thermal detection of like the structural units within buildings. And then we're linking all of this together under the focus of like uh, cultural heritage work with at the intersections of like environmental science, geosciences and archeology span and anthropology. So we're all looking at that. Um, uh, thank you all so much, by the way, as I'm sure you uh, saw uh, earlier, um, if you wanna reach out to me, uh, my my email is Woodson at Woodson at gmail.com if you want to contact me. It's all found on my LinkedIn if you also want to uh, look at what I'm currently doing. If you also, please feel free to contact me on LinkedIn as well. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Hamza. And uh, before I turn it over to, to Hannah and Julia, just a note for the um, for the presenters, if there's links at any point, um, so sort of you know the content information or, or links about the projects you'd like to share, feel free to put them in the in the chat at any point during the webinar. Um, and also for the attendees, uh, please start thinking of uh, questions uh, you might like to ask when we get to the questions and answers. Uh, so, uh, Hannah and Julia, you have the floor. Thank you, Nate. Just waiting for the presentation to pop up. Okay. So um, thank you for the wonderful introduction. My name is Hannah Gamran, and I'm joined by my colleague, Julia Bauer. Our project was D4, Data-Driven Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Davidson College. So one of the important things that we wanted to provide was context before we jump into our project and um, the way we went about it. So Davidson College is a small liberal arts school located in North Carolina, 30 minutes outside of Charlotte. 
Um, and here you can see some of the uh, demographic information. It is a relatively small campus um, with 1,927 students um, or enrolled students at the time of our survey. Um, and you can see that the college has a policy of meeting 100% of demonstrated or calculated financial need. Um, additionally, Davidson College has a, a high representation of people who come from the highest uh, socioeconomic income bracket. Um, and so 70% of uh, Davidson College students come from the top 20%, um, economically speaking. And less than 1% of students at Davidson come from a poor family, but become a rich adult. Uh, additionally, I wanted to highlight relevant programs on campus that touch on some of the areas of our study. Lulabells is a uh, program on campus that provides students in need access to food, as well as interview clothing and additional support resources um, as, as they need. Um, and so it's important to understand the existing resources on campus, as well as the demographics of the student body to truly understand what are the diversity, equity, and inclusion needs on campus. So I'm going to give you a overview of our methodology and our approach to the project. At the very beginning, we knew that we wanted a project that created a model for students to follow on campus and create a model that could be replicated on campuses throughout the United States to take a data-driven approach to diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts on campus. We wanted this model to have publicly accessible, easily intelligible, valid, and replicable means of institutional assessment and accountability for existing on-campus programs with appropriate context-specific adaptations. So we really wanted to make sure that we are situating the individual institutional data within a national context. There is, for example, national data available on college campus food insecurity. Um, and so we wanted to understand how our institution compares to uh, the national needs that exist. So we started with a literature review. And one of the important things to note about this project is it relies on the experiences of students to guide the areas of study. So uh, we start with the literature review based on some of the areas that we think are particularly impactful for students on campus. And then we narrow our key assessment areas based on our literature review. So we focused on college campus food insecurity, educational resource accessibility, and student time affluence or allocation. And this last category was a little bit harder to assess. Um, the general definition of time affluence is used in psychology is different than the way we utilize uh, this terminology. It really focuses on the different factors that pull on students' ability to dedicate their time and divide up their schedule uh, based on the existing priorities that they have. So college campus students, of course, need to study and attend classes, but oftentimes students also work jobs to support themselves. A lot of them have uh, sports scholarships. And so all of these things present competing interests for a student's time. And we wanted to see um, you know, how those competing, competing interests affected students' time on campus. Uh, we focused on establishing a survey methodology that balanced key considerations like the granularity of our data compared to um, making sure that our survey was relatively short so that students could actually, uh, we, we could increase the completion rate and make sure it was representative. We also adapted it specifically to Davidson College's context. So we wanted to ask student experiences regarding uh, the utilization of programs like Blue Labels and see whether there was, for example, an existing on-campus stigma related to, to using these resources. We went through the IRB process for review and uh, then went on to disseminate uh, the data that we collected after analysis through broad means of communication, such as emailing the whole student body to create um, a, a kind of public record or archive of uh, the work that we've done, and then have more targeted communication towards affinity groups or student groups who um, are particularly impacted by diversity, equity, and inclusion issues on campus. And we presented this research to Davidson College faculty and staff, as well as an individual meeting with the college president to discuss our findings and evidence-based interventions, as well as at the North Carolina uh, Association for Institutional Research Conference, which happened spring of that year. Um, then we met with other relevant stakeholders. And at the end, we really wanted to make sure that this was a self-sustaining model, that this is a long-term institution at Davidson for years to come, so that the change that we make is longitudinal. Um, and so we essentially recruited student researchers based on their individual areas of expertise. And we have a current, we currently have a 13 student team that focuses on five key areas, data analysis and communication, survey design, 
communication and collaboration with key stakeholders, the IRB process, and other responsibilities such as um, looking into uh, funding to make this a sustainable project um, for, for many, many years to come. And then we utilized our budget to focus on uh, primarily research incentives so that we could ensure that our survey was representative and students were being compensated for the time that they put in um, to participating in the survey, as well as um, just presentation logistics and ensuring that uh, we made our presentation and the, the means that we used for disseminating data on campus as accessible as possible. Um, and so we are excited that this work is ongoing and that hopefully this will result not only in an archive of data that's publicly accessible and uh, trackable throughout the years, but it results in collaboration with key groups on campus and um, as well as uh, high level officials within the college to result in evidence-based interventions. Thank you. And I'll transition over to my colleague, Julia Bauer. Thanks so much, Hannah. Um, so I just wanted to say a word about uh, textbook accessibility at Davidson in general. This is, I think, morally a very um, worthwhile topic that we should know how we're supporting our financially most vulnerable students at the college. I also think timing wise, this is a very interesting topic at Davidson in particular. Um, Prior to, let's see, 2020, Davidson's on-campus resource center, Lulabelle's, offered uh, limited four-day textbook rentals where they only had one copy of each required textbook. Um, so obviously that created conflicts with students who needed the same textbook at the same time. Um, and following 2020, with some student activism that we were both involved in, they changed from the four day rental period system to free semester long textbooks for every student who needed it and who self identified as having financial need. Um, and the policies at Davidson continue to shift. So I think, as Hannah mentioned, we're really interested in the longitudinal data that will come from this project. And I think it will be very interesting to see what happens in some of these key resource issues on campus and the data that we see from students. Um, okay, so just to start off with, just under 40% of students reported that they had access to all of their required texts, but that they had not bought or rented all of them. And this is significant because it suggests that students are accessing books through non-traditional means. So whether that's pirating them online, which we did see come up in the qualitative data, or whether they're leaning on resources like Lulabelle's um, for help when they need it. Uh, this is significant finding in that, you know, those on-campus resources are addressing at least some of the need on campus. Just under 7% of students reported that they did not have access to all of their books. So for one or more courses, they did not have the required course text, which su suggested to us that um, the college needs to do more outreach to students to let them know that Lulu Bells exists, that there are library partners who can assist them in accessing materials free of charge. Um, we suspect, although we, we don't know this for sure, that um, some of this 7% figure comes from first year students who might not have enough institutional knowledge to know that there's a free resource for them on campus. Um, and finally, we saw that 62.5% of students reported that they had not purchased a textbook one or more times because it was too expensive. So in addition to the students who um, maybe on a given semester don't have one or all of their textbooks, it, a really sizable percentage of survey respondents um, had said that textbook cost was an issue at least one time in the past. Okay, and just, I won't get into the qualitative data um, but I just wanted to say some of the general themes that we saw were that people were generally very dissatisfied with the college bookstore because of cost and um, shipping and stuff, stuff like that, um, that a lot of students were uh, getting access to their textbooks through illegal means online, that students were very frustrated with professors um, for not being transparent about the the material costs associated with their courses and wish that there were some sort of institutional policy so that they wouldn't accidentally enroll in a course with a $300 textbook and have no way out of it. 
And we also saw that for low income students in particular, that access codes were a big issue. Um, for those of you who don't know, an access code is a one time code that you get that usually accompanies a course textbook. And at the end of the semester, the code expires. So there's no resale value, uh, which is problematic for students who need to recoup some of those costs. OK, I'll also just um, add a note about food accessibility and time inf affluence at the college. Um, Time affluence, we thought about roughly, like Hannah said, in terms of work study, out of school obligations. And it's interesting in that um, a few years ago, when we were both students at the college, we've recently graduated, Davidson's minimum wage for students was $7.50 for entry level positions. And the cost of purchasing a meal at our primary dining facility was $9.25. So, you know, as you know the inflation crisis, the cost of living continues to increase in Davidson and pretty much everywhere across the country. These two issues are increasingly interrelated, particularly for students who might have a full tuition scholarship, but who need to work to support their um, non-tuition expenses like housing and food, etc. Okay, so one of the first issues that we saw come up quite a few times in the data was that, and this it was in the qualitative piece, but I'll, I'll remark on why this is important, is that the cost per meal at Commons, which is our primary dining facility, is $9.25 with dining dollars and $13.80 without. So Davidson meal plans are split into two. One is number a certain number of swipes that you can use at Commons every week, and the other is a chunk of dining dollars that you can use around campus. Um, as you might expect, lower income students are more likely to purchase smaller meal plans with a smaller number of dining dollars. So when they exhaust those dining dollars, the cost of purchasing a meal at Commons um, goes from $9.25 if they had dining dollars remaining um, to $13.80, which is an almost 50% increase. Um, so we saw that and that was quite concerning. Uh, just shy of 28% of students reported that they occasionally or frequently did not have enough money for food within the past 12 months whereas 33.6% reported that uh, they occasionally or frequently did not have enough money to eat balanced meals. And so this is interesting in that there's a percentage of students, at least in our sample, who have enough, identifies having enough quantities of food, but don't have high quality food. So that's an interesting um, finding in that it sort of, you know, challenges our, our understanding of the state of food accessibility on campus. Okay, and then again, pivoting to time affluence, we don't have a ton of time to go into this in detail, um, but 51% of students, and these were only students who identified as having some sort of position on or off campus, said that they strongly, strongly or somewhat agreed that they would not want to work their jobs part-time on or off campus if there were no financial motivation to do so. Um, so we thought this was pretty significant because that more than half of students are saying they wouldn't they wouldn't work maybe they would study or socialize if they didn't have to because of financial reasons um we also saw more generally in the qualitative data that students who couldn't afford to go home on breaks were very frustrated with the um lack of availability of food that they often had to deplete all of their dining dollars over the course of a short break which left them more prone to food insecurity for the the rest of the semester um, and we also saw one or two comments about students opting into um, break service trips because they knew they wouldn't have to uh, grapple with food insecurity during those breaks. So just uh, to conclude, we want to acknowledge all of the wonderful folks at Davidson and at AAAS who made this, um, this research project possible. We're very excited to see where it goes over the next couple of years, and we want to thank you for, for making this possible. Wonderful. Thanks so much to you both. Uh, all right, uh, Sierra, uh, over to you. All right. Hello, everyone. And thank you, Nate, for kind of mediating this and allowing us all to share our research with the community. So um, my name is Sierra Lavaroni. I'm currently a second year master's student at Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, I'm excited to be able to share a portion of my research titled The Re Association of Highly Degraded Human Remains Found in the East Marshall Street Well. Um, before we get started, I would like to share the ancestral acknowledgement that we recite before we access any of the remains in any way. This serves to um, show respect and 
remember what these individuals and their families have been through. So if you would like, um, either to yourself or out loud, wherever you are, please um, join me for this acknowledgement. We acknowledge the lives, history, and unrecognized le legacy for those individuals whose remains were discovered in the East Marshall Street well, and pay our respects to both elders past and present. And just an additional note that any images you might see in this presentation are not of actual the actual remains from the well. And to start off, I'm gonna go through a very brief timeline of the well. Um, unfortunately, I don't have enough time to go in depth, but if you would like more information, we are holding a more in-depth session on Monday. So um, please feel free to join that virtually or in person. Uh, so in 1844, through different um, archives from Richmond libraries, it was noted that the camp, the medical campus would source cadavers for current medical students to the practice of grave robbing. These were unlawfully obtained remains that were used for autopsy specimen, amputation practice, and anatomical models before being disposed of in the well. So different student doctors were using these remains for illegally obtained and then putting them in a well, which brings us to 1994, where during the construction of the Hermes A. Contos building on the medical campus in Richmond, Virginia, they uncovered a well containing human remains. Uh, once this well was uncovered, the site was hastily dug up with a backhoe and the remains were deposited outside of the well behind a fence for archaeologists to dig through. Um, this was to not slow down the progress of the construction so that um, VCU could put up this building as fast as possible. This process led to um, commingling of their remains, which means the start and end of one individual was no longer clear since they had um, dug up, been dug up from their original position and um, thrown into a pile somewhere else. Once as many of the remains were recovered as possible, they were sent to the Smithsonian in DC for the anthropologists to try to pair them back together as best as they could. So they would try to pair um, arm bones with other respective arm bones to get a, as much of a picture of the individual as they could. Um, it wasn't until 2011 that the report for, by the anthropologists was issued. At this time, also a documentary called Until the Well Runs Dry was also published. This documentary shined light on VCU and the improper conduction of the uncovering of these remains. This brought a little bit more um, light to the issue in the community. And then in 2019, the remains were transferred back from DC to Richmond, where different um, committees were also implemented to start making a conversation in Richmond about how these were improperly dealt with and how to reconcile that. Uh, like I said, we don't have a lot of time in our um, plenary session on Monday. We'll go much more into depth. There's also a web link up here for these panels with much more information. And these panels are now published in the Contos building where the remains were found. Very quickly, uh, my research is directly guided by the research goals set out by the Family Representative Council. This council serves as the living voice for the remains and actually plays a part in how the remains are handled. Here I have listed all of the research goals set forward by the FRC. The, goal, the goals in bold here are goals that have been accomplished, while the other ones are currently still in progress. My research falls directly under the sixth recommendation right here for DNA testing. Um, I encourage everyone to also follow this additional link to look at all the other suggestions that the FRC has made for the treatment and bringing home of these remains. Now that we kind of have a little bit of background knowledge, I'll get into exactly how my how I play a part in this research. So this schematic shows the initial plans for the DNA testing that we came up with in the light blue boxes here on the left. Um, this has been already completed by a previous researcher while the boxes in dark blue are what is currently being worked on right now. So once the workflow for these dark blue boxes is complete, we'll bridge the gap between the two different segments here to rejoin the crania with all of the other remaining bones to create whole individuals. Um, with that, there's a large, there's, we have to take a closer look at how this workflow uh, for obtaining DNA from highly degraded bone works. Um, this process is depicted here, it has been optimized by everyone in the East Marshall Street well um, through a lot of hard work and a lot of time. So this was not done by me at all. This is 
uh, group effort for sure. So first we start off with a, regular, a rigorous cleaning of the bones to prevent contamination from the surface. These bones are then set to dry overnight. Once they're dry, we begin the sampling process where we take um, the surface of the bone off to again, um, remove the possibility of contamination. And we take 40 milligrams of bone powder from the inner cavity of the bone, which is where we found to have the highest DNA yield. These samples are then moved on to extraction where the DNA is isolated using paramagnetic bead chemistries. That just is, um, it interacts with the charge from DNA to kind of pull it out of solution so we can wash and make sure the DNA is clean. Once we've isolated all that DNA, we'll move on to quantify and figure out how much DNA exactly we have in there. And once we figure out exactly how much DNA each sample has, um, any sample over a certain threshold that we set, we'll move on to amplification and detection. So for amplification, we're using PCR to take one portion of that DNA and make several copies of it so that we can later detect it. This detection is done via capillary electrophoresis, and we're specifically looking for NL genotypes. So you may be asking me, what is an NL genotype? Well, um, these are insertion null pieces in the genome. So these are dictated by either the absence or insertion of retrotransposable elements. These have a stronger ability to amplify smaller targets, which is best for the type of samples that we have, since our um, remains these remains were in the well for hundreds of years, so the DNA is not of the best quality right now. So you can see in this little schematic right here, this is an electropharogram. This is part of the detection that we get um, in the final process of the workflow. So here at this locus, you can see that there's an I and that there's an N. The human genome is diploid, so that means one of the um, peaks came from the mom, one came from the dad. So here, this would be homozygous at this locus for one insertion and then one null. However, in this one, since there's only one peak that's an I, this indicates that this individual is homozygous at this locus, having received an I from both their father and their mother. Now, once we do go through that process of um, figuring out what the profile is for each location for each of the samples, we then go through a couple different statistical softwares. So the first one is called GeneMapper IDX. So this is where we can look at all the detection electropharograms that we um, developed and edit out any of the artifacts within the profile. This could be um, instrument artifacts or biological artifacts that don't lend any information towards who the individual is. So those can get edited out. And once we have nice clean profiles, we'll put it into another statistical software called Familius, which is depicted right here. And using that software, we can see matching between different um, samples. So you can see these two samples here had a very high match, which means they were consistent with each other. And we can confidently say that these two samples um, belong to the same individual. So again, we'll go through and do that for all of the profiles and all the samples, and we'll start to um, put them together. So as of right now, we have identified 13 individuals, um, individual one being one of the larger groups so far. So they have two humeri, a radius, a couple ulna, a tibia, and a fibula, fibula that have been identified to be that one person. So we're currently still working through all of the um, both paired and unpaired remains from the anthropologist to try to reassociate, reassociate these individuals. But this is some really exciting data that we're actually being able to reassociate these individuals. And this leads me kind of into the impact of my research. After we reassociate these discrete individuals from the well, we'll be able to give them a proper burial, which again is one of the recommendations from the FRC. Um, so I'm excited to see how how far we go and how, how many individuals we're able to make. Um, we are still in the midst of this project, but we have some really promising data and I'm very excited about where we're going. Um, and yeah, that's it. Um, if you want to contact me or have any questions, uh, my email is right there. And I, again, want to thank you all for coming and listening to my research. Thanks so much, Sierra. Now, we, I would welcome the other panelists to uh, please turn your video on and come back on screen. Um, we're getting close to three o'clock here, but we did start a few minutes late. So I think we can have maybe about 10 minutes or so uh, for questions and answers. Um, 
And so again, encourage the audience. I see we already have one um, question that hopefully we'll be able to get to in, in a minute. Um, and others, if you have um, questions or comments, please feel free to, to post those uh, as well. Just um, very quickly, just to, to highlight um, what Sierra mentioned, we'll have an additional uh, couple sessions on the East Marshall Street Well Project um, and at the conference on Monday, um, one panel that will be live streamed in the morning and one, one workshop in the afternoon uh, for in-person participants. But those will really dig more into the human rights and, and ethical issues involved, what do responsible community collaborations look like, and the, sort of the sense of what the, the practicalities of, of doing this work responsibly look like. Um, so, so while um, we see if there's any other uh, any other questions, I do want to ask one um, quick question for you. And this, unfortunately, is going to, have to be a little bit of a little bit of a lightning round. Um, but I'd love to hear from each of you. Uh, what is one human rights or, or ethical issue that you have encountered in your work? Um, how did you address it um, or seek to seek to address it? Um, and what did you learn from that experience? Uh, Hamza, you can you can start us off. Hello, hello. Uh, sorry about that. Um, just the preface about the presentation specifically. I am a little sick, so I've been having trouble like communicating. Uh, um, but also, I think just like looking back, this is like two years ago when I did the project. Um, I think so. The the project just to give some. Just to preface this as well, the project was conducted through Johns Hopkins uh, Solar Lab, which stands for like Spatial uh, Observation Lab uh, for Archaeological Research. Um, and so, what we were because we were looking at such a, uh, I was working with a bunch of like academics, but I was also working with a lot of political figures. So I'd be like, hey, we have we have information of like your your territory, or we have information of like current. Um, we have uh, information of current like aerial data, right? And, and what happened was because we're taking very, um, very information sensitive data, uh, and we're taking pictures of very information sensitive areas, um, we had to play a lot of different uh, like communication games with it, when it when it uh, came to uh, communicating with like officials on both sides. So we actually communicated with people from the EDF and then we also communicated with people from the Tigray and T Defense Force. And then we also had, we had to maintain a very fine line of being like, we will not uh, be providing any pictures of like any current like holdings or any like settlements uh, that might pose a threat to a lot of these communities just because they then they can use those pictures these were very high definition pictures. So the project used our $5,000 to get very high resolution pictures and very current pictures of the area. Those pictures could be used in very dangerous hands because those same, because the, the company that we were working through uh, is the same company that is sometimes used by like nonprofits, but is also used by um, all like other governments and stuff. Um, and and, and it's for that same reason, because the pictures are so updated and high resolution that those pictures can be used for um, the, to find like a strategic targets to bomb, right? Or strategic targets to like infiltrate and stuff like that. So we had to be very careful. So in terms of like the ethical nature of our project, in terms of like what, what we were scared about was um, having our information leaked before we could process it in a way that we could publish it in a report that that we could leave stuff out and also it'd be it would be such a time after to where that that data would not be relevant anymore so that was our big a uh, worry i think during the project and during like and that those are a big ethics question i think that we were talking about a lot uh sorry for like going off on a tangent about that but yeah <laughs> thank you um Sierra, is there, uh, I want to give the others a chance too, but you're, I know your project is ongoing, but is grappling with these issues a lot. Uh, so is there anything you, you want to say? Yeah, I think that? we, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there, but there there are a few um, kind of ethical considerations and kind of just identity considerations we have to take into account when we're dealing with these remains. So since we're trying to maintain the utmost respect for them, we have to be careful about how much information we're giving out with um the samples. So I, in this presentation, I showed you some of the sample names, which is fine. But in other presentations where we have a little bit more data, a little bit more, maybe we know what they look like, or we have their full 
DNA um, profile that we're developing. We have to be careful that we're not giving out this information to people um, and we're maintaining the respect for these remains. Um, we also have to be careful about pictures. Um, we've been asked not to share any pictures, so we have to make sure that anything we're sharing is not directly um, pictures of the remains. Um, so there's just a lot of considerations such as that just to show the most respect that we can while still trying to do our science, you know. I'm in quickly. Um, we had a similar, I don't know if it's sort of on the border between like a human rights issue and more of just like a re research ethics issue. Um, we also had um, to put some thought into data privacy and we went through, thankfully, the IRB process. So everything was very much like uh, we were operating <laughs> with some pretty strict standards in place, which is great. Um, but we also had, like I'd mentioned in the in the presentation, we had a section for like numerical quantitative data. And then we also had a free response area. And in those, obviously we were asking about things like food accessibility, textbook accessibility. So you wouldn't think that those would necessarily be very personal issues, but they can be if you really have struggled with food insecurity at a very, very wealthy, small selective liberal arts college. Um, so we had some students revealing yeah, some potentially like identifying information or or naming people at the college they had met with whom they weren't pleased with or um, were really frustrated by. So we just had to um, do some thinking about how like best to carry their message forward without compromising their privacy. And if I can also jump in, one of the other things that we um, encountered was in trying to make sure because our, our project was really focused on bringing to the forefront issues that marginalized groups in particular experienced on campus. And with that, you have to try to reach out to marginalized communities and ensure that they're adequately represented in the data. As Julia mentioned, Davidson College, um, those marginalized groups are very well represented um, in terms of like the on-campus population. And so it makes it difficult not only to reach those groups, but um, in terms of you know, the safety of the environment, right? People feeling comfortable sharing that kind of data or participating in a survey, um, even if everything is anonymized, I think that there's still uh, an understandable apprehension in doing so. And so one of the things that we also encountered was trying to find a balance between like how we reached out to different communities on campus. And this is, I think, situated in the context of institutional research or just on-campus research in general. A lot of times, for example, uh, students would be doing research for their thesis and would like continuously email like affinity groups on campus to try to get them to participate. And I think that you know there are a lot of ethical considerations that go into that um, because there has to be whenever there is data collection uh, a reciprocal benefit to those who provide their data, and there's an ethical obligation on behalf of researchers to ensure you know, that that data is used in a manner that's beneficial to those who participate and to marginalized communities. And so that's something that we have really had a lot of conversations about and have brought to the forefront when we were putting together this group that's doing this work this year, the considerations surrounding, you know, what is owed to those who participate and how do we make sure that those who share their data, we're making change on campus that addresses the issues that they face. Meg, is there anything you would like to add from your experience? Yeah, kind of on not the exact same topic, but um, my um, project was happening more so in the thick of COVID. Um, so when it came to, you know, especially a project in with the topic of like oral history, you know, how do you interview people with, you know, keeping COVID and COVID precautions in mind, especially for folks who do come from, you know, historically underserved and marginalized communities. Um, it was really, it was a challenge for me to figure out how to, um, you know, still acquire the best um, deliverables, like, you know, really high quality interviews in terms of like technology, uh, tons of the grant um, funding I use were also for, you know, technological components like interview equipment and stuff like that. Um, and it's, you know, much easier to interview someone, um, you know, in person, like with recording equipment, um, but also the per the human aspect of it, you know, it, it's like I mentioned, I think before, um, 
a lot of times these interviews um, ended up, you know, we were talking about really personal stories, personal anecdotes, you know, things that may have happened or experiences that folks had that came from their identities. And it's a lot easier to create, um, you know, a relationship with folks when you're in person with someone and you can, you know, look into their eyes and build a rapport. And so managing that during the times of COVID was really challenging, you know, with respect to respecting respondents' needs and boundaries health-wise and also, you know, creating high quality, um, you know, interviews that were, um, you know, that were what we were hoping to get. So that was that was a challenge that I faced and um, really, you know, communicating and planning accordingly was some of the ways that we overcame that. Um, and, you know, just being aware of the world around us and how, you know, health is also something that's really important, especially with different folks who come from different communities. So that was that was very interesting and a challenge. Thanks, everyone. I see there's a couple questions in the chat that you were typing uh, responses to, so I don't I don't want to cut that um, cut that short. So maybe we'll do um, one more lightning round uh, real fast. Not everyone has to to answer, um, but be curious for any thoughts you have. Uh, so the theme of this conference is uh, related to the human right to science, and kind of core to that right are ideas of access and participation, and so I'm curious in, in your work, if, as briefly as you can, what are some of the benefits of community engaged research that you've seen? Um, and are there any challenges um, in addition to what you've already mentioned that you want to highlight? I'll start off this round, Nathaniel. Um, so one of the benefits that I found um, was, you know, intergenerational input and wisdom. I think some of the most profound interviews I had were from folks who are from older generations. Um, and, you know, especially I was in college at the time, the people who were in my first and foremost, you know, community were other college students who were my age. And so I was not communicating with, you know, for folks um, of a lot of other generations. And when I was able to connect with them, I learned so much and was able to, you know, relay that information through my interviews. Um, and I would not have had that if it weren't for, you know, really delving into the different aspects of my community, including older folks. Alongside that, though, there are some challenges. Um, I know this is kind of, um, you know, this is like a trope of, you know, older folks sometimes not knowing how to use their phones or being technologically challenged, you know, in some of those aspects, um, working with folks like that, it was more difficult um, and it required definitely more time and planning um, and thinking about how to improve, you know, access to different things and improve awareness to things. Um, and I think one of the things that I took really seriously was access, you know, how can I make my transcripts and my, or excuse me, my interviews and my deliverables accessible to all. Um, and I actually used the part of the grant funding to um, do a, um, a transcripting service. So all my interviews, my interviews were anywhere from like 15 minutes to an hour and 30 minutes. And I would transcribe, I would use this software to transcribe all my interviews so they could be put into transcripts so that folks, you know, who could not read or who preferred, or excuse me, could not hear or who preferred to read could have access to them to make sure that, um, you know, all of the barriers that I could create for someone, I also were mitigating um, and was aware of that. Thank you. Thanks, Meg. Uh, does anyone else have uh, anything you'd like to add? All right. I think in, in that case, we'll bring this to a close. Thank you all so much. Uh, please join me in thanking our Panelist, thank you for the uh, participants and the attendees who've asked some great questions um, and have a great rest of your day.